before we talk about what image processing is, let's uh, recall what images could be. Yeah, because uh, there may be more things called images than you uh, would immediately think when talking about images. So we have many, many different image modalities and the simplest kind of image would be 1D images, which are just some signals like here, a simple sign or a sign plus some noise. And then of course, what everybody should think of images are typical photos, yeah, 2D colored or grayscale photos. Yeah, and I selected two uh, very iconic ones that you see in all the image processing papers and some from an older research uh, project. Also, uh, videos can be interpreted as images. Yeah, there we have just three-dimensional images where we have two spatial and one um, temporal axis. Then there are lots and lots of medical uh, image modalities, for instance, MR, CT, PT, and those have in common that usually this is three-dimensional. So these are volumetric images with three spatial dimensions. And uh, for instance, with CT, you can then use, uh, make like things transparent. And here, instead of the uh, head, you can look at the skull, for instance. Then there are many uh, modalities from electron microscopy, insbesondere, uh, in particular, transmission electron microscopy and scanning transmission electron microscopy. And we will see some of those images later. Yeah, and um, what's important here, and I guess you probably already see in other talks during this workshop, that we can here zoom down to the atomic level. Uh, then there are similar looking images origin from simulations, yeah, for instance, where you simulate how a crystal uh, solidifies from, from a liquid. Now uh, you can see here some, some growth that's going over time. That leads then to some grains where different crystal orientations are touching each other. And then there are so-called hyperspectral uh, images. So this looks like a signal, but here we do have such a signal at every pixel. So it, again, it's like a, a volumetric image, but uh, with the third dimension being the channel or the spectral dimension. All right. What are fundamental tasks that you consider when you do image processing? Probably the uh, most easiest and well-known one is image denoising. Yeah? So you are observing some image, which is what you actually want to observe, plus some noise, yeah? noise from the camera, for instance. And uh, I think when you heard about BM3D earlier uh, this week that you had a good look at state-of-the-art image denoising. So I'm, I'm not about state-of-the-art image denoising, but just giving you some examples and some uh, strategies to approach these kind of uh, problems. Then there is uh, image deblurring, which you could see as a variant of denoising. There you do not observe the image directly, but the image after it's composed with some operator. Right? And here it's a linear operator, for instance, and just a linear blur. And you want, you know, you're giving Z and you want to recover the original one, removing the blur. And then there is uh, image segmentation. Uh, again, you are given an image, but now you want to decompose the image into meaningful components. And for instance, here, this would be foreground and, and the background. So the cameraman and the rest of the image. And the last uh, fundamental problem I want to mention is image registration. There you are given a pair of images, which are supposed to show the same or a similar object. And you want to bring them in a common coordinate system. So why do you want to do that? Uh, this medical uh, example, I think it's always good to motivate this. Uh, imagine you uh, are a doctor and want to do diagnosis, and you have these two different uh, insights. And if you just overlay these, which you would uh, need to get the combined information, you can see this, this doesn't fit. But it's uh, naturally clear what you would have to do. You would like take the one and shift it so that it overlays with the other, which uh, mathematically means that we are looking for a so-called deformation. So that is a mapping of the image plane into itself. An image plane often is just the 
unit square such that if you compose one image, the template image, that you get something that resembles the reference image. And actually, if you look at this, there are immediately many questions. What could be a suitable notion here of this equivalence or this similarity? Because it strongly depends on the uh, application. Here you can see uh, the gray values here, for instance, are not very comparable. And this is solved with the similarity measure. Another big question is how do we represent this deformation? Uh, in this simple case, one translation vector would be enough, but uh, we will see other examples where we actually need um, more complicated uh, deformation models. Uh, and how you actually compute this is then the matter of optimization. Uh, and uh, there's a very nice uh, pair of introductory books to this by Jan Murasitsky. So if you want to get uh, into image registration, these are a very good starting point. All right. In the title, I said variational image processing, and we haven't touched that uh, what this variational approach means at all. And um, this can be seen as an idea to approach a wide range of problems, not even limited to images. And what's going on there? So you will you have your task at hand, let's say registration, and you have to rephrase this somehow as conditions on the solution that you're looking for. And then you need to find a function that measures how well the conditions are fulfilled. And a very simple example would be the registration of two gray value images. Uh, these are slices here through MR scans of sugar beets. And uh, we would align them by finding the so-called non-parametric, non-rigid deformation. So you can see a simple shift is not enough. I really need to uh, like take this uh, shape here and deform it in a very non-linear way so that it resembles the other one. The similarity here is very simple. We can just say that pixel-wise, the gray values should be similar uh, because we're just aligning black and white. Also, we want the deformation in this case to be smooth. So that means neighboring pixels are shifted in a similar manner. And this can be measured by a small Jacobian of the displacement. Yeah, so um, I'm not looking at the deformation directly here, but I'm subtracting the identity. So I'm only penalizing movement. Uh, and now we can uh, put this into a function that measures all of that. So the first part here measures the first condition, and now the second part measures the second condition. And uh, you can also take a somewhat more general viewpoint. The first part applies some forward model to your unknowns and compares it to your data, and the second part is some regularizer. Yeah? And now you solve your problem by solving this minimization problem. And this structure here, data term plus regularizer is very typical, and not only for registration, but also for other tasks and inverse problems. And uh, what is important and also a drawback of this variation approach is typically is that the different terms have to be weighted somehow. Yeah? And you have to decide about the importance of the terms. And this is balanced by a weight that you have to set or estimate in some way. Yeah, and this is how a simple example uh, result could look here. Here are the two input images. This would be the deformation that you can compute, and it will tell you later how you would actually compute that. And uh, yeah, here is the aligned image. Yeah, and you can see that here by this nonlinear deformation, we really get the uh, structure of the beat that we that we try to approximate with this alignment. So let's head look at, at the other problems. How can we phrase those as minimization problems? Image segmentation. Here, our, let's call our input image G. And uh, one way to decompose it would be to find uh, this region of the foreground. Uh, here, just the cameraman. And also average gray values for the foreground. This is the Z1. And the background, this is the C2. And then 
a valid minimization minimizes this energy. This is the so-called piecewise constant binary mumford char model. Now, that's a very famous uh, or variant of a very famous functional. And let's see what's happening here. So inside the foreground, we are comparing the input image to the foreground color. And inside the background, we are comparing the image to the background color. Uh, and the decision is, what do we put in O? Which of the points belong to the foreground? Which of the points belong to the background? And depending on what we choose, we either pay this difference or that difference. And if we imagine we would not have this one, this would be like just a simple thresholding. If G is closer to C1, it would get into the foreground. Otherwise, it would get into the background. And now we want some regularity because likely neighboring positions here will be in the uh, same segment. So we penalize by the so-called perimeter, which is essentially just the length of the boundary of the object. Yeah, And by, uh, by doing so, um, we ensure that the uh, boundary part here is, uh, is short. For instance, that's the reason why this part of the uh, of this uh, camera holder is not not there because it would be uh, like very long. It would have a very long uh, boundary, but a very small volume. Now that's uh, removed by the regularizer. And uh, yeah, also coming back to image denoising, same uh, strategy as with the registration. Yeah, we construct a simple data term. So we want our denoised image to be close to the input and we want it to be smooth in some sense. And here the uh, famous RF model is, uh, is a very good starting point. And we will look into that later in more detail. And similar, you can also solve the deep blurring problem yeah, by just adding your forward operator here into the data term. You also do like the deconvolution as part of the, um, of the minimization. Okay, now that we have looked at this, let's uh, try to take a more general viewpoint of what we are actually supposed to do here. So we are in some norm vector space and we are supposed to find a minimizer of some objective function on some miscible set. Yeah, so that's the uh, notation, this J is the objective and M is the um, admissible set. And in the following, when I say vector space, I always mean real vector space, where we will not consider complex vector spaces here. Yeah, and this structure is very similar to classical optimization, but uh, the dimension may be infinite, so that x can be a function space. And there are central questions that uh, immediately arise if you look at the problem from uh, this way. First, are there actually minimizers? Yeah, so we can... Uh, shouldn't try to minimize before we know that there is actually a minimizer. And um, I will later briefly sketch that the uh, infinite dimensional case here um, has very large implications. Also necessary is how can we characterize minimizers, uh, like in the sense of necessary and sufficient conditions. Those can be used to um, then also efficiently compute minimizers. And uh, I would like to delve in now directly, uh, uh, skipping like these more theoretical parts and look at some ways to, in practice, solve the registration problem. Yeah, so let's uh, look at variational image registration uh, for a moment to get to see some um, general minimization concepts that are used there very often. And uh, yeah, first, let's take a second to realize that this problem is actually quite highly ill-posed. Yeah, writing down was very easy, find this phi such that one image composed with the phi resembles the other one, but there are many uh, kinds of problems with this. So for instance, the solution cannot be unique. This really depends on, uh, on your data. For instance, if you have something like this, yeah, one rectangle that is supposed to be registered to two rectangles, then the solution could be put this here or put this here, for instance. Yeah, either way would be, uh, would be fine. Also, small input changes here can lead to large output changes. 
So um, imagine this example. Here is a slightly darker and a slightly brighter rectangle. And here is exactly the opposite situation. So the solution would be a rotation like of, of the image by uh, 180 degrees. And now I slightly change the data. So I make this slightly darker and this slightly brighter. And suddenly the solution jumps from being 90 degree rotation to just the identity. Uh, and also uh, the uh, deformation could be discontinuous. So if you try to align a large rectangle to two smaller ones, the uh, data term would like to like split up this and uh, put it into the two rectangles. And it really depends on the, the task, whether you want to allow for this or not. Uh, and some of these uh, problems can be resolved by uh, regularization. But um, in uh, any case, yeah, this would give you existence of minimizers, but probably not uh, uniqueness. But in any case, you still need a very good, uh, sophisticated minimization approach for this kind of non-convex uh, co optimization problem. And one key that is here uh, pretty much used in all the uh, registration approaches is first a multi-level strategy. Yeah, that means you go from coarser to finer resolutions, and I will sketch that next. And for every resolution, you need something for the uh, for the actual optimization. For instance, radi uh, regularized gradient flows, which I also like to sketch very uh, briefly soon. And there, uh, if you do this with an explicit gradient descent, you also may need some kind of step size control. Okay, multi-level minimization which I mentioned before. So you start with a nested hierarchy of meshes. So something very coarse, something on getting successively finer. And each is a representation of your image just with coarser and coarser resolution. And then the idea is that you first solve your problem on a very coarse level, which removes many of these fine, uh, fine structures. And uh, then prolongate the solution from the coarse level to the finer level as initial guess for your optimization, and then continue doing so till you reach the optimum on the finest level or on the level of your data. Yeah, and for instance, in the uh, beat, uh, sugar beat example that I showed you before, this was actually computed here on, uh, on four levels. And you can see on the uh, first level, this is uh, a very coarse representation of the beat. And the um, further you go with the refinement, the more and more fine structures you see and that the uh, registration then can pick up. Yeah, and uh, I mentioned that one could use regularized gradient descent. And uh, so what is that? I guess everybody knows the uh, gradient descent like this, so you always go in direction of uh, steepest descent. So let's say this is your this is your objective. You are somewhere. Here is your minimizer, and the gradient tells you that you need to go in that direction. Of course, in one D, it's a quite simple picture. It gets much more complicated in higher dimensions. And um, a key property of such a gradient descent is that it's attracted to the nearest minimizer. So um, let's imagine the situation looks like this. Uh, if you start here, you will go over there, even though the global optimum is uh, over here. And uh, to understand what nearest means in this case, Let's uh, recall that the gradient is the best linear approximation of uh, our objective, like this. And here we use the Euclidean inner product. But we are actually free to use any inner product uh, that we would like. But as long as we use the inner, uh, Euclidean inner product, we perceive distances in the uh, Euclidean sense. But we could just put any other scalar product here and uh, this way get a different gradient. Yeah, and changing this inner product now changes which minimizer is the nearest minimizer. And you can use this to 
favor desired solutions, uh, properties of your solution. Okay, let's uh, look at what's happening here now. Uh, this is the uh, gradient flow with respect to this scalar product G. And uh, now you can rewrite this with the inner product representation A, yeah, if you use uh, this representation theorem, and then you see what the inference of this, uh, of this is. Yeah? We are applying the inverse of this uh, A. And for instance, if we would choose this kind of uh, scalar product, so this would be a scaled Sobolev inner product, uh, where we scale the gradient part with uh, some weighting depending on sigma, then the inverse here is regularizing because this is uh, actually an implicit heat equation time step with, uh, with the step size. Yeah, in this way, your gradient flow would uh, prefer regular solutions. Yeah, and you can do a step size control, but I see that for some reason the, uh, the figure broke. Hey, what about optimal transport for this? Yeah, well, what about that? Uh, Solving optimal transport or? Yeah, you're using optimal transport to do this. I mean, if. Uh, yeah, well, you could actually uh, uh, do the nice image registration uh, via optimal transport. Yes, this is a quite different uh, approach to this, but. Uh, I like it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. In case for this uh, dec um, gradient descent, if we do this explicit time discretization here, we need to uh, figure out what a uh, good uh, step size is. And for this, there are many different rules around. And uh, one of my favorite ones is the Amir rule. And essentially, uh, I have to draw this differently. So this is like looking at the objective in uh, one direction, and then uh, you can compute the derivative, and the derivative gives you an estimate how much decay you would expect. But um, if you then go a certain uh, way in that direction, this is actually the decay that you do get, yeah, because you uh, are not down here, but just over there. And if you compare now this slope of the secant and the slope of the tangent, this is the quotient. So this is the expected decay and this is the actual decay. And the idea is that you enforce a certain fraction of that. Okay, and with that, I'd like to uh, take a few minutes to uh, talk here about an application for this in electron microscopy. And uh, I'm not sure if the uh, scanning transmission accelerator microscopy was already explained before. Let, so let's make it uh, brief. So we have some, some small uh, specimen here that we want to image with an electron microscope. We shoot an electron beam through this, yeah, a very focused electron beam, and then check with an annular detector which atoms are deflected and picked up. Yeah, so, and if there is nothing at the position, the uh, electron beam would get, just get straight through, no signal. And if there is something, we get a deflection and something on the uh, hits the detector. And this is then done in a raster fashion, point by point, line by line. Yeah, and this is how these uh, kind of images can, uh, can look like. Uh, you see the atomic lattice. And uh, yeah, there are some distortions typical to the stem acquisition process, uh, which you can see with these wiggles here. And uh, yeah, so these distortions arise from environmental and instrumental disturbances. Yeah, you have to consider we are zooming here with a factor of several million. So any kind of change from the outside will change these pictures. For instance, temperature change of your sample holder by a fraction of a degree will like move it by half an atom, and this would already be visible here by a shift of a couple of pixels. Uh, yeah, and I have a very short video here, but I feel I have to switch the share so that you can see this.
Yeah, did you see the video? The jump. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, movement and um, and uh, noise going on there. Ask a question. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question. Uh, no. No. It was no question. Yeah, I was just, I just wanted to say that it's actually moving. Ah, it's moving. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Yes. So um, so you can uh, or you hopefully could see that the individual frames are very noisy and that there's a large movement of the sample during the uh, series acquisition. And uh, yeah, for this, then uh, we want to apply this variational idea. We first select a data term which uh, compares or acts as similarity measure. And for this, for instance, you could use the normalized cross correlation. Yeah, what does this do? It's essentially the scalar product of f and g, but we first subtract the mean and then divide by the variance. Yeah, so it's like a, a normalized scalar product. And as such, the values are between minus one and one. And the, uh, it's one if and only if there's this linear or fine dependence of the gray values. Yeah, and then you can use the negative cross correlation of the reference and the deformed template as uh, data term for your optimization. Yeah, and then uh, you can do this for the entire series, get a large scale optimization problem where you want to align all the frames in your series to, uh, to some average. And uh, yeah, you can show that actually minimizers of this uh, do exist if you uh, look at the correct miscible set, but that's uh, not so important. What is uh, probably more important here of practical uh, in practical terms is that you need uh, a good uh, minimization strategy. So on top of the um, multi-level strategy for each uh, uh, for each pair of images, you um, need to do something over the series. And uh, as it turned later out, and I will briefly illustrate, this is actually somewhat biased what we did there before. In any case, um, so the idea is just align every image to the next. Once you know that, you can compose the deformation from one to two and two to three to get this joint deformation from one to three, which is a good initial guess. You can refine and so on. And this way you can align everything to the first frame. And uh, yeah, so there's another video, but it will just show you that this is aligned. I guess we can, uh, we can skip that. And this is uh, what the... Uh, Reconstruction then will look like. And if you zoom into this, you can see that uh, here after the uh, alignment, you can distinguish the peaks in this dumbbell. Yeah? The individual frames didn't show this, but the uh, alignment uncovers this. Yeah? And you can do this also for other images. And you can wonder, uh, how can you evaluate the reconstruction? Is there some ground truth? And uh, what... Uh, I think Paul Waltz then recommended is back then was to do a precision analysis. What does that mean? So we detect all the atom centers. We compute these marked distances for all the uh, atom centers pair. So for all, also all these distances uh, and all these uh, distances and then compute the standard deviation. And since this is supposed to be a perfect crystal, the standard deviation should be zero. And uh, in electron microscopy, this is called precision. Yeah, And with this uh, approach, you could get very nice precisions below one, uh, one picometer, which is uh, some advancement of what was there before. Yeah, and with that, for instance, you can uh, analyze defects in the crystal lattice. Yeah, you get a uh, very high signal to noise ratio images. And um, you can also get an estimate of uh, the thickness of the, uh, in this case here, particle. Yeah, what, what I didn't mention is that the um, intensity here scales, uh, assuming that the atoms in this column are all uh, the same, the scales linearly with the thickness, so you can estimate the thickness of the atoms. And uh, here, and I think I should need to switch so that we actually can see this video because it's, uh, that is an important point.
that the alternating minimization strategy that uh, I proposed before has some bias. And uh, this can be seen as follows. I hope the uh, video changed. Uh, the, the view changed, and we have seen a video here of the initial data. So there are some very uh, artificial deformation going through um, the sample, which was just uh, like which should average out. And if we do the registration, yeah, it, it corrects all that movement, but it sticks like to the first frame. Yeah, and you have this very artificial distortion in uh, in y direction, which is not averaged, averaged away. And now let's go back to the other chair. Yeah, how can we uh, correct for this if we still want to do alternating uh, minimization? Yeah, first, we can uh, observe if we have uh, a translation. We can actually compose this here, all the uh, so the image and the um, all the deformations with something without changing the objective. And now the idea is to reduce the deformation by finding like the inverse of the average of the deformation. Yeah, so we compose this uh, unknown psi with all the phi's, and we want this to be close to the identity on average. Yeah, and then uh, we can like subtract this average deformation that we find by composing it. And then the alternating minimization strategy is extended with this computation of psi step. And this now introduces a direct coupling between these uh, different deformations, which was not there before. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so with the videos, I think you don't need to see them, but here in the uh, registration with, with the reduction, this is then fully uh, corrected and we get a nice, uh, nice grid. Now you can then compare some, some images with this, uh, with and without reduction. What is uh, uh, interesting? thing here is that the strain that you could estimate from these images had uh, quite some uh, unphysical uh, properties with this, uh, without the bias correction that were nicely reduced if we use them. Now, okay, let's get that. You could have all the source code if you want to, but uh, that's uh, not the main point here. Just something else I want to, uh, want to mention is that these uh, averaging ideas are in no way linked to or limited to images. For instance, if you have like uh, these volumetric structures, which are actually characteristic functions, so one inside the bone, zero outside, now these are all uh, pelvis bones, you can construct an average pelvis with essentially the same, uh, the same objective function. Okay, but uh, now let's uh, have a closer look at uh, the more theoretical questions and also get away from uh, image uh, registration and go more towards uh, good space for images and total variation. So existence of uh, minimizers. I just like to sketch this uh, very briefly so that you get an idea what's uh, what's going on here. So first, uh, one obviously necessary condition is that the your objective needs to be bounded from below. Yeah? If it's unbounded from below, there is no, no minimizer. Yeah? This is not a sufficient condition. Uh, even if you think e of e to the x, this does not have a minimizer, but it's bounded from below. But in any case, there is then a minimizing sequence. So that means a sequence of points so that our evaluations converge to the infimum. And then there is this well-known direct method in the calculus of variations that uh, allows to uh, check or show the existence of minimizers. And the strategy is, yeah, first select this minimizing sequence. So what we have before, then you need to somehow establish that this sequence has a convergent subsequence with some limit x star. And then you want to show that this x star has to be your minimizer. And for this, you need so-called lower semi-continuity of your j. Uh, this is uh, exactly this, uh, this estimate. And um, 
what does this mean? Essentially, it just means that the uh, functional values doesn't jump, uh, don't jump down. So if you think about this kind of a function which has a jump, the value would need to be here for the function to be uh, lower, uh, semi-continuous. And so this other case, if the value is here, this would not be lower semi-continuous. Ah, and if you have that, you can just uh, plug everything together. So the uh, infimum value equals to, um, yes, the evaluation of the minimizing sequence. You can go to the subsequence, go to the lim inf, which is the same since it is converging. Then you plug in the lower semi-continuity. And of course, this is bigger uh, equal to the infimum. And on both sides of the equation, you have the infimum, so everything has to be the same. That means this is a minimizer. And applying this in the finite dimensional case is actually rather simple. It gets, uh, uh, this is the case because in finite dimensions, all norms are equivalent and norm bounded sequences have convergent subsequences. Yeah, the situation is very different in infinite dimensions. And I don't want to. Uh, really go into this, just note that uh, you even note a different notion of convergence, weak convergence, but there you have to go into functional analysis to actually solve these uh, problems. But um, what sh we should care about is, what, why should we care about this? Because you can claim after discretization, my space is finite dimensional anyway, so uh, I can just do this and check that there is a minimizer in finite dimensions. Still, I'd like to make the point that you should care because this uh, infinite dimensional functional space setting gives you some information about inherent properties of the solution. So for instance, about the regularity. So what can you expect your, uh, your minimizer uh, to have as regularity? And um, yeah, now uh, going in the direction of um, image denoising. So the simplest thing that you could do is uh, the following. Now we take a simple data term and a very simple regularizer. And unlike the uh, RF model I showed before, there's a square here. And there is a square because this is a very nice, uh, nice functional on a, a nice, uh, on a nice favorite space. And um, it is continuous. So this is something one would like to uh, would like to use. And now if you uh, do this existence of minimizers, you will realize that the minimizers exist, but they are in H12. So they are uh, in solar space with one weak derivative. And uh, if you want to denoise images, you have to wonder, is H12 a good space for images? And uh, for this, it is important to note that images can have edges and edges are jumps in image intensity. So, which means that the images are discontinuous over uh, over uh, sets of co-dimension zero. So, uh, a very very simple uh, uh, example image would be just take some set D of bounded domain inside our uh, our omega, and then we look at the characteristic function. So, let's say a black circle on white background. So very, very simple image. And uh, you can show that this is not in any Sobolev space, no matter which dimension and no matter which uh, P bigger equal or one you use. So that means this model here is not uh, suitable in, in any way. Yeah, so we have to do something else. And uh, yeah, I'd like to motivate that uh, at least the H one one norm is a very good candidate for uh, for some regularizer for images, and uh, this you can see from this one D observation. So the uh, the one norm you know, it's just the uh, integral over the absolute value of the, uh, the the one semi norm. It's just the integral over the absolute value of uh, of y. And um, let's say this y is increasing, then we can drop the absolute value. So this just integrates to the difference y1 minus y0. So actually, this means that 
the size here of the uh, uh, of the semi norm is independent of the derivative. So it just matters how um, what the uh, difference at starter endpoint is. So this function and this function and this function they all have the same eight one one semi norm. And in particular, that means one can ac approximate such uh, functions with a jump, for instance, with a sequence bounded in the H11 norm. But still, we need to extend the H11 norm to such functions. And uh, we need a more general concept for this than weak, uh, even weak derivatives. And uh, for this, let's uh, have a look at what's happening on our integrand. So this is the... Uh, it's the norm that we have, and we can rewrite it like this. So the uh, norm of our x with something uh, of uh, length one. You can replace this by the supremum. Use uh, Cauchy-Schwarz, and you get here back the norm again. So that means we can rewrite the norm as the supremum. Yeah, so why does this help us? Um, if we do that on the integrand, and we are just collecting this in some uh, some smooth function that is pointwise uh, uh, in the Euclidean norm smaller equal to one, then we can take the gradient here because we remove the absolute value and put it onto the P. Yeah, just integration by parts. And since this has uh, compact support, we don't have uh, boundary terms and we end up with this integral. Yeah, so that means we can Evaluate the uh, this semi norm here, even for y and l one, yeah, and this motivates to define this as uh, as new uh, new semi norm, and this is called the total variation. And then we look at the space of functions of bounded variation that uh, are just those l one functions where this total variation is smaller than one, yeah, and then uh, the BV norm is uh, the sum of the L1 norm and the V norm. And you can show that uh, the H1 norm is bounded from below and from above with the BV norm, which means that we created a new space that this BV is sitting between H11 and L1. Uh, and we realize this is too small for images. And uh, now we created a bigger space that hopefully can ca uh, capture our discontinuities. And that's uh, what I want to sketch very briefly here. So let's check what is the uh, total variation of, for instance, the heavy side function. So this is a jump at one uh, point. So it's looking looking like this. So a jump height of exactly one, and we can show that the semi norm is one. And it's actually rather easy to see. We plug in uh, or we check what this uh, integral with the divergence is. Yeah, in one D, it's just the derivative. Yeah, the uh, heavy side just changes where we're integrating, and then we can actually compute this integral easily and see that it that it's as most one. And uh, if we put uh, both by uh, side by side, if we take a p that's looking like this, we will actually get the one. Yeah, so the supremum here is one. Yeah, and you can do the same with uh, with two jumps if you have the characteristic function uh, of the interval a b. Yeah, let's not uh, let's not uh, look at that too much. Just counts your jumps, and you can also do that in uh, multiple dimensions. So, for instance, two D, we have the now the characteristic function of uh, a circle, and again you can. Uh, really just compute what this uh, divergence term is here this time with uh, just apply the divergence theorem once and um, we get that this is at most the length of the boundary of the set. Yeah, And there are also admissible p's such that it uh, works. And in general, one can show that for uh, a D that is piecewise, that is piecewise smooth boundary. The uh, total variation of the characteristic function is just the length of the boundary. And this also motivates the definition of the perimeter that I uh, sketched earlier for the Mumford Schar functional. Yeah, and uh, 
if you think about this as a regular riser, this uh, will actually smooth the boundary of the sublevel sets. All right, and uh, this uh, gives us the uh, very famous ROF model. Yeah, we now formulate this on the space BV that we just uh, introduced. You can show existence again with the direct method. Yeah, that's a bit more complicated because BV is not the Hilbert space, but just the dual of a separable space. But uh, yeah, let's not get into that. But if you now uh, write down the problem that you actually want to uh, want to solve, that's a saddle point problem. Yeah, you uh, we just input here the definition of the total variation and see that we want to solve a saddle prime problem. And this is uh, what I want to uh, do on the next, uh, as the next step to show you some classical algorithms in this, uh, in this area. But for this, we need to briefly characterize minimizers. And one thing to note here is that the total variation is not differentiable, but only convex. Uh, but with the convexity, you get uh, very different ways to, to tackle this problem. Yeah, and I think everybody knows uh, that the necessary condition for minimizers of differentiable functions is that the gradient vanishes. And also there uh, is this well-known uh, relation between convexity and uh, derivatives. So if you have a function, and that is convex, you can go to any point, uh, any point x, and you compute the tangent. Yeah, And if your function is convex, the tangent is below the function. This is what, exactly what, uh, what these equations here uh, just uh, summarize. And uh, by this, you get directly that uh, for convex functions, the necessary condition is actually sufficient. So if you have gradient zero for convex function, this is a minimizer. And there's really not much to prove. You just insert it. Yeah, this uh, function bigger than uh, tangent, and then this is zero, and you immediately have the minimality. Why I'm uh, sketching this very, very well-known things is because uh, you can generalize this notion of tangents to subdifferentials. So um, now we have a convex function, not necessarily differentiable, and we look at all the u's where the corresponding uh, line or plane is below the, um, the function. And the set of all these so-called subgradients is the subdifferential. And what, what does this mean? Let's have a look at this example. So let's, this is the absolute value. And uh, yeah, at differentiable points, there is only one slope that uh, fits beneath. Uh, if we look here, it's just this one slope that fits. But if we go uh, to this point, uh, all the slopes between minus one and one fit. Yeah, so that uh, means here there's not only one, but a whole set of uh, subdifferentials at this uh, point where we have non-differentiability but convexity. And then minimizers are equivalently characterized by the fact that zero is in the subdifferential. Yeah? And the proof was well, also extremely uh, simple. It's more just this notation. Yeah? Minimizer means j of y star is more like equal j of y. But um, j of y star can be written like this if zero is in the subdifferential. Uh, and we get immediately the uh, minimization. And just for the sake of completeness, uh, if you have differentiability, then the subdifferential consists just of the classical gradient. Okay, and with this, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the proximal operator, which is the basis for many, many different um, optimization algorithms in uh, the uh, context of non-smooth but convex optimization, which is very uh, often occurring in image processing. OK, so um, first, a little bit of notation. We consider some function 
whose values in R infinity, so it can be uh, can be infinite. We call the effective domain just all the points where J is finite. The epigraph is just uh, everything above the graph. And a function is called proper if the epigraph is not empty, which is equivalent to uh, the fact that there's at least one point where the function is not infinity. And um, if X is now a norm vector space, a proper convex functional is called closed if also the epigraph is closed. Now it's just some uh, some notation to define the set gamma zero. Uh, and you will see now why we need that. Namely to con uh, consider this proximal mapping. Yeah, there we are starting with some reflexive Banner space and we are in this, uh, in this gamma zero, but you can also think finite dimension if you want to. Just think of this as Rn to simplify things. So what are we doing? We are mapping any point to the minimizer of J plus some penalty. So let's let's make a picture to figure out how this uh, how this looks like. Let's say our J looks like the level lines of our J look like this. So it's getting smaller and smaller in this direction. And then it may be infinite here. So if we now are at any point, what does the proximal mapping do? So we want to go to the minimum of, of J, but we are like pinned to some degree at the point where we are. So what will happen is that we'll only go a certain amount in this uh, in the direction of the minimizers, which are like here at this at this front. Yeah, and depending on where we start, we get closer and closer, but it's clear that we not will not not overshoot. Yeah, and this is called proximal, yeah, proximal mapping, proximal operator. And I only needed all these uh, uh, conditions so that this is uh, well defined. Yeah, so that it exists the unique minimizer. Again, I don't want to bother you with this. This is a direct method, and this gamma zero was just such that you can apply the direct method and the uniqueness you get directly from the strict convexity of this. And uh, one thing to note is that uh, this gamma zero does not even ensure that, uh, bless you, that there is uh, a minimizer. For instance, a linear function has no minimizer but fulfills all these conditions. Yeah, again, I, I just introduced this, this subgradient, and this we will uh, need now to figure out what we can do with. Um, with the proximal mapping. And now uh, we only consider Hilbert spaces, but it's also fine if you just think about Rn. The first thing to note is that minimizers and fixed points of the proximal mapping are the same. Yeah, so the only uh, case like where uh, this here will not move you if you already start, so if this Y already is a minimizer which uh, like allows you to uh, yeah, describe minimizers as function, uh, as an equality. And uh, just some technical uh, stuff to rewrite this, you know, this uh, function equality of the uh, proximal map can be rewritten as such an inclusion directly by using this necessary condition that I sketched earlier. And then this is linked to the resolvent operator here. Yeah, but I just mentioned this for the sake of completeness. What the, actually the thing that you should uh, take to the next slide is the following, that this inclusion, which can come from a necessary condition, can be expressed in terms of a proximal map. Yeah, so the proximal map allows you to rewrite an inclusion condition as an equation. Yeah, and these equations you can solve very differently from uh, solving these inclusions. Okay, now really let's go to finite uh, dimensions and uh, look at some proximal maps. Let's say we have a constant function. Uh, we plug in the definition of the proximal map and we see 
that this is just the identity, which uh, also uh, fits to what we have heard before, because for the constant function, every point is a minimizer, so every point has to be a fixed point of the proximal map. Can I make a comment here? Yes, please. Uh, it's interesting to note that what you're doing is solving a partial differential equation where tau is time, and this is the exact solution uh, to what I might call Berger's equation, Hamilton Jacobi. You are solving the, the uh, not the augment, but of course the Moreau envelope, the solution of this whole thing, is a solution to u sub t plus the gradient of u squared over 2 is equal to 0 with initial data, whatever multiplies tau. Isn't that nice? And yes. That, and that explains an awful lot of what's going on. Very nice. Uh... That is, you didn't know that. You should know that. I mean, this is uh, the, the Cole <laughs> Hoff, uh, uh, sorry, Hoff Lax, whatever the heck it is. That is the solution to a very important PD which comes up all the time in uh, optimization. Namely, the verb is ut plus grad u squared equals zero is what you get with this thing. Yes, no way, yes. I, uh, well, now you know. I have seen that. Not only have you seen it, but it's a very interesting thing because you can screw around with that and use that to do non-complex optimization, which I can tell you about sometime. This thing leads to a very nice uh, algorithm. But For non-convex optimization. Yes. I mean, the, the basic idea is uh, that's Berger's equation without viscosity. You add a little bit of viscosity, and then you use yet another transformation, which transforms after the heat equation. And the whole caboodle is very easy to compute because it's, an, it's a zero-order optimization. So you might mention this in your overviews. All right, that's my speech. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Okay. Um, let's uh, also look at some uh, some other uh, proximal maps here for um, just a squared difference, yeah, just a square two norm. You can also uh, directly compute the proximal map and get this uh, straight format, uh, straightforward uh, formula for that. And uh, one thing that is very helpful here in this uh, case is uh, if the uh, objective is separable in this sense so that you are like summing, for instance, over your pixels and uh, at every pixel you uh, is values separate, then you can, uh, to compute the proximal map, you can just do this separately at, uh, at every of these uh, entries of your, of your vector, at every of your pixels. Another important uh, proximal map is uh, for the one norm. You know, this then is uh, nonlinear and leads to the uh, so-called soft threshold operator. And uh, a further example here is uh, if we look at the indicator function of a convex set, so zero inside the set and infinity outside, then um, the uh, proximal map of this is just the projection to the uh, set C as a Euclidean uh, projection, which uh, will be very useful to taking into account constraints in these optimization problems. Yeah, and uh, as we noted, finding minimizers of J and uh, fixed points of the proximal map are equivalent, which leads to the uh, simple proximal point algorithm yeah, for some uh, step size uh, T. So we just iteratively compute the uh, proximal map. And if there is a minimizer, then one can show that this uh, converges to the set of minimizers and uh, the evaluation to the optimal value. And uh, if we here assume that this is uh, also differentiable, then you can write down the necessary condition for uh, the proximal map. And um, yeah, if you then compute the gradient, you uh, can uh, rewrite it like this and see that this is just the backward Euler discretization of the gradient descent. 
Yeah, that's uh, for differentiable J, the proximal point algorithm is actually the fully implicit gradient descent. And uh, yeah, for most uh, image processing problems, the uh, proximal point algorithm itself is not very uh, practical because this proximal map cannot be computed efficiently if uh, J consists of multiple components. And um, for this, the concept of operator splitting is very helpful. Yeah, and here uh, we uh, consider now the situation where our J is the sum of two terms, and we assume that one of those terms is not only convex, but also differentiable. And um, this then leads to the so-called proximal gradient algorithm, where you uh, do one gradient descent step in the differentiable function and one proximal step in the non-differentiable convex function. Yeah, and then you can uh, use this uh, formulation here to write this in terms of an, an update. And um, yeah, this is uh, called forward-backward splitting since it uh, combines an Euler gradient descent step in G with the proximal point step in H, which we just noted is the backward Euler step. So that's the backward point. And yeah, convergence of this uh, algorithm is also quite well known. Yeah, if we get also Lipschitz continuity of the gradient of uh, G. Yeah, first one would show this kind of helper statement, but uh, let's uh, not look into that. But um, with this, we can, given that the step size that we use is uh, uh, big or equal to uh, some strictly positive minimum step size and smaller equal one over the Lipschitz constant of this gradient of G, then uh, we get convergence, at least in case minimizers exist. And you can even say what the uh, rate of the uh, convergence is for this algorithm. Yeah, and uh, if you look at this, this also gives you directly convergence of other methods. If you say that G is zero and H is just some uh, some J, so your non-differentiable part is uh, zero, then this uh, well, the differentiable part is zero, then you actually have the proximal point algorithm, which is then uh, converging for all uh, step sizes bounded uh, from below with some positive constant, since the gradient of zero, of course, is Lipschitz constant. Uh, Lipschitz continues with constant zero. If you have the other case, J, uh, G equals J and A equals zero, this is the fully explicit gradient, uh, gradient descent. And uh, again, with Lipschitz continuity of the J, you get convergence for suitable step sizes. And finally, if you have G equals to J and some H is now the indicator function of a convex set, this gives you the projected gradient descent algorithm, uh, which also falls into this framework. All right, um, now let me uh, jump to a more, uh, or to a different uh, or extended algorithm, which is fully proximal and does not have this uh, gradient descent term anymore. And for this, I'd like to introduce the Fenchel conjugate. Now for all purposes, it's sufficient to know that this is the, uh, the definition and um, we want to further the refine the operator splitting. So we again have uh, a sum of two terms, the greater term and uh, regularizer. And uh, here we additionally have a linear term. For instance, you can think of like the gradient. So that H would be uh, like the norm and A the gradient. So we would have the norm of the gradient. So to further separate this the second part. And why uh, does this help? So this is the inf uh, optimization problem that we want to solve. And then, um, yeah, for the Fenchel conjugate, one has that the double or the biconjugate is the original function, given that your starting function was convex, which uh, this H here is. So we can introduce the uh, biconjugate and then insert the definition of the conjugate giving us this extra supremum. But uh, the benefit of this is that the A 
is removed from the argument of the H. Uh, and uh, that means here you end up with a saddle point problem like this. And you can then write down the necessary conditions. Yeah? So this is uh, for convex optimization. As I sketched before, we just have zero element of the subdifferentiable. And then you just solve or, or resource or sort this to get these uh, inclusion conditions. And now you can take these inclusion conditions and express them in terms of this proximal mapping evaluations. And this motivates then the following fixed point algorithm. So essentially you do a fixed point iteration between these two conditions, but there's uh, an additional extrapolation step. Yeah? So this is like, this is the direction and you would, uh, you would go with the uh, update in Y and here's some, this is uh, pronounced by some extra factor, theta. And the uh, nice thing about this, as I sketched, is that we do not need to compute the proximal of H of A. Yeah, and A, if it's like the derivative, this is something that uh, combines neighboring pixel values. This is now moved out, and we just need the proximal map of H star. And... Uh, yeah, typically, then this now can be computed point-wise and very efficiently. And that's something that was uh, proposed uh, for by Chambord and Pock, and it's an extremely popular algorithm in that area, also called primal dual hybrid gradient method, which is actually one variant. There are actually many different uh, things around. Yeah, and this is well suited for the total variation as, uh, as regularizers, and you get uh, convergence guarantees if theta is one and uh, this factor here is smaller than one. So the step sizes are limited by the norm of your linear operator. Yeah, and actually this is a very uh, uh, popular field and um, active, uh, active algorithm. So actually if for theta equal to zero, this is uh, called uh, Arrow-Hovitz algorithm and this was already used for TV minimization uh, somewhat before. Uh, there are uh, like accelerations with some preconditioning. It has been extended to Banner spaces. There are stochastic extensions uh, more recently where you uh, do some uh, sampling of the dual variable to a speed up. So like um, similar to a stochastic gradient descent. There are also stochastic extensions to actually solve stochastic minimization problems. Then uh, also this has been picked up in uh, machine learning, uh, for instance, we see learned primal dual reconstruction, where uh, the idea is that you take a certain number of steps in your algorithm and you unfold this and interpret like 10 iterations of your algorithm as 10 layers in neural network. And then you can start learning part of your algorithm. And um, some more recently, there also has been an uh, extension to Romanian manifolds. So for instance, if you have manifold valued images, and of course it's by no means an exhaustive list, there are many more algorithms uh, in, this, uh, in this direction. Okay, and now let's uh, take a minute to work this out for the ROF model. We do a very simple discretization. Yeah, our image is now just a matrix, one value for one pixel. The uh, Data term is the squared difference. Yeah, for that we have seen uh, what the L2 norm, uh, well, what the proximal map is. Yeah, just a simple uh, vector scaling and addition. Forward, uh, so the derivative we simply approximate with uh, forward differences here in, in X and in uh, Y direction. And then our h of this uh, discrete gradient is the one norm of the discrete gradient. Yeah, and with this, uh, the uh, the RF model falls exactly into the framework that uh, I just catched for this uh, Chambord-Pock algorithm. For this, we also need to compute the Fenchel conjugate of our h, so the Fenchel conjugate of the one norm 
Yeah, and there you can show that it's actually the characteristic function of the following set. It's just uh, like in every pixel, there's a vector of length at most one, then the value is uh, yeah, zero as convex uh, indicator function. The and otherwise it's case. So, doing, sorry? In an anisotropic case, the canonical thing is a square here. You should take the L2, uh, you know, the max of the... Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, this is meant, this is the L2. Aha, uh -huh, you didn't say that. Yeah, 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 ah, yeah, okay, I'm not completely consistent. So yeah, when I write uh, one line, this is a Euclidean norm. Yeah, yeah so it's more complicated in the anisotropic case, it's, yes. I think we have a paper, me, you, and Martin, and some other people, where we look at stuff like this. Yes, yeah, yeah. The, the anisotropic total variation is uh, yeah, okay. something uh, Go for it. Yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, and in any case, so this is the uh, uh, H star, and um, so the proximal map then is a projection to the set. And if you now put everything together, so this projection is actually very simple. At every pixel, you just have to scale these vectors. If the length is already smaller, equal to one, nothing happens. Otherwise, you scale by its length. So that means um, the entire algorithm looks like this. And this can be done uh, very easily uh, in Python, for instance, or MATLAB, or whatever your preferred choice is. And of, of course, you still need to know what the uh, this two norm or this norm uh, operator norm of your linear function is. And in this case, you can show that it's here bounded by h divided by h square. And actually, I wanted uh, here, and that's probably a good thing to almost conclude, to show you how uh, how simple this is. So in case you uh, want to test this, you can uh, go to this link. And I will open it here to show you what the uh, final result is, and that you can actually play with with these kind of approaches. Uh, yes, I need to switch to this. Yeah, so if you go to that link, it should look somewhat like this. Then you can go to the uh, R or F example, and uh, yes, so run the first uh, cell. So this is uh, an implementation of this PDHJ uh, uh, method that I just sketched. And you can see that the steps that I promised, if you take like a minute or two to look at this, are uh, really as uh, as simple as this pointwise projection by the uh, scaling and this linear uh, addition. Yeah, so just a very uh, few couple of lines. I yeah, just need to con construct these gradients and then um, you can actually run this on uh, on a simple image, yeah, and it should run directly in your browser. Yeah, and I hope one sees this well enough. So here is a noisy uh, uh, noisy image, and after the uh, denoising, we can see that the edges are still uh, are still there but the noise is nicely suppressed. But the, the biggest part of this is that here that you can nicely, uh, easily experiment with these algorithms here. All right. Let's go back to the slides. Oh, yeah, and there, of course, uh, as I mentioned, various uh, variants of this algorithm will also exploit more structure of the G. For instance, the strict convexity that we have here in the uh, squared two norm can be used for uh, faster convergence. And actually, I uh, I think my time is already up, Peter. Right. It's over, yes. Okay, then I think we can uh, just uh, take this opportunity to stop here, and I uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>